in Louisiana, it's our weather. Uh, very unpredictable, very hot, very humid. The plants don't seem to be liking that part, but we do have uh, storms that come off the Gulf. So we're doing some trellising. We're just trying to prepare for any type of damage to the plant. That's Angie Deal, a hemp farmer in Singer, Louisiana, just north of Lake Charles, close to the Texas border. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock. We've got quite a show lined up for you today. First, we'll talk to Angie Deal about hemp in Louisiana. Then we'll check in with Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association to hear about that fiber crop she's growing in partnership with New Holland Ag. And then we'll talk to Lancaster County hemp farmer Steve Groff to hear about his direct seeding trials and how the COVID shutdown is affecting his labor crew. But first, a little bit of hemp news, and we're going to check in with Lancaster farming correspondent Tom Vineski. Tom, can you tell me about uh, what's going on up there in, was that Luzerne County, Butler Township? Correct. It's Butler Township, which is a agriculture slash, slash residential those are the two main uses in the uh, municipality. And uh, recently, the Board of Supervisors proposed a amendment to their zoning ordinance that would establish a 1,000-foot setback from residential areas for farms that, that grow hemp within the township. And they had a meeting last week uh, to discuss the ordinance, a public meeting, and there were uh, two farmers from the township that that grow hemp in attendance and one farmer jason hawley uh his farm's name is hempsylvania yeah he's been on this show before yep yeah yeah he said that uh this 1000 foot setback if enacted would essentially put him out of business because all of his the majority of his farm fields are within 1000 feet of residential areas uh in butler township so he, he expressed uh, concern, obviously, at, at the meeting uh, in that regard, and he feels like uh, the ordinance could could not be legal, per se, because it, it would be overridden by the Right to Farm Act uh, and the Acres Law. Uh, so he, he felt that uh, it's not a legal ordinance to begin with, and if it did get to the point where it was enacted uh, above and beyond that, uh, he couldn't. He could no longer operate as a as a hemp grower in the township. Right. Do you have any sense of why the township is doing this? Well, it, it seems that the the supervisors are concerned about the odor that comes from a hemp hemp growing operation, mm-hmm. and uh, they, they don't. They're trying to avoid conflict between residents and hemp growers when it comes to the odor. But it was mentioned at the meeting that. This odor uh, can carry quite a ways. It's not going to stop at 1,000 feet. Uh, there's not a, a force field or anything that's going to stop the odor right at 1,000 feet. And it is a it is all this all the hemp in the township are being is being grown in areas zoned for agriculture to begin with. This is a crop. Uh, so how can you regulate an ag crop for an odor? And it's being grown in an agriculturally zoned area to begin with. The, the odors seem to be a big thing. There's also some uh, mention about processing, hemp processing on farms and harvesting for that matter. Uh, should that be considered an agricultural activity or is it an industrial activity? And there was talk about if that's being done on farms in the township, then maybe that should only be done on properties that are in industrial or mining zoned areas uh, as far as processing and, and harvesting and things like that go. Wow. The farmers in attendance requested that it be tabled. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean, tabled? Well, they, they didn't vote on it. It was on the agenda for a vote, but they decided not to vote on it. What they okay. did do is that they agreed to send it to the state attorney attorney general's office for for review and that could take 30 to 60 days if not more before the attorney general's office reviews and issues a recommendation basically is this a legal ordinance or is it not a legal ordinance the hemp growers in the township they already have plants in the ground now would they be required to move them or destroy them or or what's sort of the, the state of the the hemp grow in the township now 
Well, because it was tabled and because it was sent to the attorney general's office, they kind of got a, a reprieve, if, if you will. Um, just the time that it's going to take for that office to review this is going to carry it out past the harvest season. They have plants in the ground, they're going to harvest them, and then this issue will be revisited after that when the Attorney Got General's it. office gets back to uh, the township on this. Okay, so they get a pass for now. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, keep an eye on this story. Tom, thanks for reporting on that. My pleasure. Tom Vineski is Lancaster Farming's Northeast Pennsylvania correspondent. So yeah, sounds like something stinks up there in Luzerne County, and it's not the hemp. Okay, next up, we're going to talk to Angie Deal from Ideal Hemp in Louisiana. Uh, I've decided that I'm going on a mission to talk to as many hemp farmers in the United States as possible. I want to talk to at least one farmer in every state to start. And so to that end, I let my fingers do the walking, and I found... Angie Deal. Angie, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Angela Deal. I am from De Quincey, Louisiana. We are a small town just north of Lake Charles, near the Texas border. How long have you been growing industrial hemp? This will be our first year to grow. I have, however, been in the industry for several years. I am a regional sales director for one uh, company, Cypress Hemp, and I am a distributor for two other companies as well. Oh, great. Okay. Can you describe the, um, the grow that you're undertaking this year? Yes, sir. We are in the process of a two-acre grow, which in the beginning we thought was small. It is actually not. It's very labor-intense. Mm -hmm. We are doing one acre of CBG and one acre of CBD, and we are also growing some autoflower. Oh, good. Okay. Um, can you describe sort of the, um, you know, your spacing and maybe your irrigation and just sort of the, the setup in the field? Yes. So we are doing, uh, because this is our first year, we're doing a little bit of research or test grow. So some of our rows are spaced three to four feet apart. We have some that are five, six, and seven feet apart. Okay. Um, we wanted to be able to go back at the end of this year and see which rows did better. Uh, which maintenance, and most uh, of the plants are some 16 inches apart, some two foot, and some three foot in row spacing. Okay, and you're going to do all hand harvesting? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Everything's by hand. Okay. We planted uh, actually a total of 4,900 plants. Wow. Okay. And then so what's your plan for drying and then processing? We have two options to us this year, um, and a lot of it, of course, will depend on whether we have, you know, a good source of flour in our plants, and we won't know that, you know, until the end of harvest. Yeah. Uh, but we have a 50 by 100 born that we plan to do hang to dry with a fan and ventilation, and then we have another building that will be uh, climate controlled. Oh, good. Okay. Um, can you tell me a bit about, you know, working with your state's Department of Agriculture and sort of how the program works there in Louisiana? Sure. So Louisiana requires a license. Uh, Louisiana Department of Agriculture is over that. Um, this year is they're also first year and they're not as familiar with this particular plant, but they have uh, done quite a bit of training and preparation. So it was actually very simple to get a license. Uh, it does require, you know, background checks uh, through both our Louisiana State Police and the FBI. Uh, and then you have to have seed acquisition reports and planning reports. But overall, uh, very easy. They've already did at least one inspection of our of our uh, grow, and we've not had any issues at all. Good. Okay. And how about, you know, sort of a, amongst the the population of Louisiana, is it an accepted crop, or do you still get people looking at you funny or how is it well actually uh in the more southern parts of louisiana i would say um alexandria and below absolutely no issues at all the mm. more northern part of our state is not as accepting from what i have seen uh quite you know recently we had uh, a city north of us called leesville that had a form that was wanting to uh, get a license inside their city limits for a 40-acre tract. 
Mm-hmm. And they came with their city council to our forum to look at it because they're very opposed to letting them have it. Mm-hmm. So um, I can see a little pushback in more of our northern area. Okay. Um, what sorts of challenges have you run into this year, either, you know, um, agriculturally or otherwise? Oh, uh, weather, our <laughs> weather. In Louisiana, it's our weather. Uh, very unpredictable, um, very hot, very humid. Um, the plants, though, seem to be liking that part, but we do have uh, storms that come off the Gulf. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're doing some trellising. We're just trying to prepare for any type of damage to the plants. Um, okay. But that would be about it. It would be the storms. We did yeah. have a greenhouse that was destroyed by a tornado. Oh. So uh, luckily our plants were not in that particular greenhouse. So that yeah. was a good thing. Um, can you describe the trellising that you built? Uh, well, the trellising is actually just with mesh netting. And you stake it out, and we're using that to just support the plants a little more. We're also doing some cross bamboo uh, stakes where we will take the bamboo and at, at an angle and and put it into the ground and uh, tie the, the plants off to it, just just to support it a little bit, give it good footing. Mm-hmm. And our irrigation system, you had asked me earlier, we have a fertigate system yep. where we infuse, and each row can be individually um watered or fed um but we also have a backpack and we sometimes will feed the plants from above also oh okay right um where did you source your genetics uh hgh hgh and are they a louisiana company or where where are they from uh no they're colorado they're They're colorado Colorado. yeah okay yes great um yeah are you, are you connected with a lot of other growers down there? Is there like a network of, of growers that you... They're, they're starting to become a network. Uh, at first, there was not. But um, we do have um, an HIA in Louisiana. Uh, we mm-hmm. do have a um, Louisiana HIA that Christy A. Bear with Cypress Hemp founded. Uh, and so some of the growers are starting to find each other through that Hemp Industrial okay. Association. Yeah. And uh, we are reaching out to each other and just sort of, you know, exchanging information. Uh, Louisiana, just like every other state in the United States, uh, I'm assuming, has a very different terrain from our southern region to our northern region. Mm. Yeah. It, can, it goes from marsh to very sandy to clay. It just, right. So the soil is not as consistent as you would think. So growers, mm-hmm. even though we're communicating, have completely different soils. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, are you concerned about the testing requirements? I, I imagine that Louisiana is, is on the um, interim final rule because uh, you said this is the first year that you're, you're growing Correct. In, in the state. Um, any any concerns about the, the THC um, testing requirements or the 15-day the rule? Uh, the 15-day rule is a little bit of an issue, and we are working with the Speaker of the House in Louisiana, Clay Sheck Snyder, who is also the author of both uh, bills for CBD. And we're trying to get a little bit more flexibility on that, we're hoping. Um, mm-hmm. But the Ag Department right now doesn't seem to be, um, you know, going against what farmers need they're willing to work with you Um, so we're not really at that point yet where we'll know if that's going to be a huge issue but we would like to not see the 15-day rule uh, so that we had more time to harvest right Um, how about fiber crops do you know of any uh, growers down there doing fiber instead of um, for cannabinoids Uh, there there are a few that have talked about doing fiber I do not know them particularly Uh, I have uh, had a lot of contact with two other growers who are growing in the same manner I am, one at a much larger scale. Uh, so I'll be interested to see how they pull that off. They're doing a 25-acre grow manually. Whoa. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. He, uh, he said he's quite bewildered. He, you know, But, of course, they go into this not really knowing how labor intense it is. And I think you can tell people it's labor intense, but until you actually experience it, just the pruning alone mm. and, you know, watching for male seeds and 
all of the other parts that go into it, it is it is really quite a job. Um, how about challenges in like the supply chain and the infrastructure down there? I mean, you mentioned weather being one of the challenges, but you know, in the, in the supply chain and how how things are going to work from field to harvest to you know an eventual uh, eventual product. Okay, so yes, that is something we're also this is. When I tell you we're like we're on Mars with this in Louisiana, we are really on Mars. We have facilities being built as we speak for processing. There's one in Homa, but of course Homa is from where I my farm is about a three hour drive. Oh. So to get plants there is going to be quite the experience. Um, there's one in Lafayette which is 90 miles from my home, so that one would be a little closer. So um, it's it's all sort of you know, new territory here. We're we're not really sure how that the logistics are going to be. It's not going to be fun because um, the first year I have a feeling this is going to be a very challenging finish to the to the growth. Mm-hmm. But we're just going to have to uh, find ways to meet the, that need and just move forward. It's it's to me it's pretty indicative of the hemp industry of a whole. You know. Um, even you know the sale of CBD, it's it's no different than that. We have challenges that we have to overcome pretty much every day with law. Yeah, it's it's interesting for everybody. Yes, uh, yes, yes. If you're not prepared to grab a surfboard and ride the waves, you shouldn't be in this industry because it's ever changing. There's problems. There's you have to correct. You you know it's just part of the industry. That's Angie Deal from Ideal Hemp in Louisiana. All right, next up, let's check in with Erica Stark. She's the director of the National Hemp Association. Erica Stark, welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Um, So last time we talked, I guess it was in, I don't know, April or May, you were very excited about um, growing fiber on property next to the the New Holland um, factory in Lancaster County. How is that going? It's going pretty well. We got a kind of a late start this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got it in the ground on June 12th. And um, unfortunately, we went almost a full week after that without any rain. Ooh. Just went over the weekend to check on it. And I'm actually very pleased. Uh, there's some there's some sparse places, but for the most part, um, it's very healthy and growing vigorously. A lot of it was as tall as me. I'm, you know, a little over five foot. So it's doing great. We did four different varietals, two that are considered dual, one that's considered a fiber crop and one that's considered a grain crop. Oh, so good. the goal of this um, is in order for them to be able to do some test runs with different equipment and have their engineers be able to have some firsthand experience with the crop and some of the challenges that can come with harvesting. Okay. So are do they have any hemp equipment available now? Yes, they have um, They have equipment that they've made kits for to sort of take existing equipment and make it more hemp friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, in other words, it, it protects some of the, the rotating parts from having fiber wrap around. Yeah, right. Um, so I would encourage anybody who is in need of equipment to contact New Hall and talk to them about the, the hemp options that they have. Um, for members of the National Hemp Association who have been members for 60 days or longer, uh, New Holland Ag is offering some pretty significant discounts on specific pieces of equipment appropriate for hemp. Oh, wow. That's great. Okay. And people can just go to newholland.com. Yes. Okay, cool. I'll have a link to that on the show page for the episode. So what else is going on in the in the world of hemp from your perspective? What are some of the things you're concerned about or excited about? Um, I'm, I'm concerned, um, as I was last year, about there being an oversaturation of the CBD market. Uh, I still am getting an uncomfortable amount of farmers contacting me who are still looking to offload their crop from last year. So I'm a little mm-hmm. bit concerned about that. Um, but I'm also hopeful because we're seeing a, a lot of rise in interest in fiber and grain hemp. And I really think that ultimately it's the direction that the industry needs to go and look 
look forward to seeing those markets open up. Um, I'm hopeful that we get a lot of a lot of good markets opening up for the cannabinoid industry as well. Uh, but we're just going to have to kind of wait and see how that goes. Right. I was looking at the the list of grower permits for Pennsylvania, and yeah, there's a whole lot of people who've signed up to grow for CBD extract this year. A lot of new farmers. As yes, well as some from and, last year. and that's always kind of concerning as well um, with new people coming in to make making sure that they understand the compliance issues. And obviously for this year, we have some unique challenges with, with COVID and how mm. it has impacted the Department of Ag in implementing certain portions of the program, like getting sample takers certified to be able to take compliance samples and some issues surrounding that. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that, that the new farmers are successful and I'm hoping that the farmers who did participate last year were um, educated themselves thoroughly on the changes between the program from last year versus this year because there, there are some significant differences. Right. Um, the one that seems to be uh, sort of getting in everybody's grill is that 15 day testing window for harvest and sort of the rigidity of the, the, the 0.3% THC threshold. Well, while I, I share that frustration, um, the, the disappointment in that really can't be leveled at the Pennsylvania Department of Ag. It really was right. their federal mandates. Um, yeah. I think that they've done their best to relax things um, based on the, you know, simple things like the, the USDA delayed implementation of the requirement of um, using DEA certified labs. So right. certainly that's a good thing, but there is work to be done um, on the IFR. And I do think there are some areas that Pennsylvania could look at relaxing a little bit while still remaining compliant uh, with federal law. Um, the 15 day window, I also think some people um, mistakenly assume that it's, you know, 15 days from the time that they get their sample taken, but they, at the same time, they have to wait until they get the results before they can harvest. And um, hmm. that is something that the hemp steering committee is going to see clarification on. But my understanding is that's not true, that you have 15 days from the time that you have your samples taken, but you could harvest the next day if you wanted to, as long as the hemp does not leave the farm until you get your clearance. Oh, okay. So I don't think like if, so if you have your sample taken and it takes 10 days for you to get your results back, then you would only have five days in which to get the harvest. So I believe oh, okay. that once you, once you get the samples taken, you can harvest whenever you want within that 15 day window. And like I said, you just have to wait for your clearances to come through before you can sell or transact or, or move that hemp. Okay. You mentioned the steering committee and you're on the leadership team, right? I am for uh, the policy and regulation subcommittee. Oh, good. Okay. And how is that going? How, how's the, uh, the whole leadership team working out? I think it's, it's, it's a little slow and steady in, in getting rolling, but I think it's ultimately going to be a very good thing for Pennsylvania. Um, I'm pleased with the my fellow leadership team members and Ron Kanner as the chair is wonderful to work with. Uh, we yep. had our first meeting of the full committee um, out, you know, not just the leadership team, but the, the, the full steering committee. And I feel that, that that went well. And anybody who's in the hemp industry that has an interest in participating on the greater steering committee, I, I encourage them to reach out because um, you know, we need to work together and make sure that everybody's voice is heard um, on some of the important issues that surround the industry. So I was looking at the National Hemp Association website, and tell me about the hemp pledge that you've got up there. Well, in our efforts to promote this industry on a grander, true commercial scale, we're asking specifically businesses to take the hemp pledge, which basically is is a commitment that they will look to incorporating hemp into their current processes or uh, future processes to start transitioning at least some of their raw materials into hemp. So far, hmm. our response has been pretty good. 
you know, and certainly having a partner like New Holland, I think is going to be very important in making corporate America understand the, the move towards sustainability and how hemp can fit in with that, well, how mm -hmm. it can help us reach our climate goals. So uh, we're very excited and the purpose of the pledge is, is several fold actually. It's not only to demonstrate how many businesses do want to start using hemp, but also to educate consumers about the importance of hemp. So we have an individual pledge and we have a corporate pledge. And we've gotten okay. really good responses for both. We just launched this like a month or so ago. And I basically just received logos from all of the companies that uh, took the corporate pledge. And now we need to update the website and start including those so people can start to see the, the level of enthusiasm that we have for hemp and also get the individual pledge members up there in order to show how many uh, consumers there are out there. And it's, um, you know, we have to build a supply chain sort of piece by piece, but it's, it is kind of circular in nature. So we just need to put the pieces of the puzzle together and get everybody on board so we can create robust supply chains and bring hemp to its full potential. And people can learn more about that pledge and take the pledge at nationalhempassociation.org. And again, I'll put that link on the page for the show. Thank you. Appreciate that. So other, other concerns, anything else you want to share with our audience? Um, well, as you know, this is a topic that we could both talk about for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to, you know, off the top of my head, pinpoint any specific thing. Um, you know, there's, there's always issues. There's always concerns. There's always legislative work that needs to be done on the state and local level. Um, but that's why we're here. So I encourage, you know, anybody that has any pressing issues that they feel need to be addressed to feel free to reach out uh, to me either through my role as executive director of the National Hemp Association or the Pennsylvania Hemp Industry Council or on the steering committee. And, um, you know, I'll be more than happy to make sure that any questions and concerns get raised. Erica Stark, thanks again for your time. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. You as well. Stay cool. Staying cool is kind of hard to do right now because we are in like, what, day 10 of 90 degree temperatures here in southeastern Pennsylvania. And it looks like that trend is going to continue for, I don't know, the next 10 days. So please pray for rain. Okay, next up is Steve Groff from Lancaster County. Hey, Steve Groff, welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Eric. It's uh, great to be back again. Yeah, so here it is, uh, working on the end of July. How are things going down on the farm in Holtwood? Well, as any farmer knows, we have our, uh, our challenges and our successes. Uh, my biggest challenge right now that's not totally hemp related, but I'm a vegetable farmer as well, and I don't have my, um, my workers, my H2A legal workers, are unable to arrive here just because of some COVID uh, issues and so forth. So that's causing a little bit of a challenge for me uh, here on okay. the farm just to get everything done. So uh, would you bring the same crew in every year? How, how yeah, does I that do. usually work? I, um, I actually have um, a crew. I have some people here that have been working for me for over 14 years. Uh, oh, wow. So they know what they're doing. And uh, basically I'm cobbling together anybody I can round up to help here. And that means a lot more uh time for me uh an oversight because a lot of these people don't have experience right. and uh with uh with what we're doing here so it takes a little extra of my time so what uh, do you got in the ground besides hemp so i have heirloom tomatoes and high tunnels and we also have some eggplants this year especially eggplant that we're growing for a specific uh, store that i sell to hmm. and then uh coming on later in the fall we'll have uh, winter squash acorn butternut and spaghetti uh, winter squash along with pumpkins. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's that's where obviously a lot of hand work is uh, right. required from that. Right. Um, do you have those squash planted yet, or is that something you, you wait a little bit yet? No, they're all planted, and they're growing. Yeah. Uh, it's a little dry right now. We're hoping for some rain this week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's we been dry. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, other than that, no, they're growing. They're, they're looking nice. I, I got to tell you, though, on the bright side, of everything, uh, I could say because of COVID, we're getting the highest prices I've ever gotten for tomatoes. Oh, um, okay. So that's the right side. So there yeah. is there is uh, there is a balance here. So it's 
it's uh, at least at least for now. Yeah. Uh, the prices are really strong. Oh, that's good. So, so that's and and part of the reason is the same thing I'm experiencing is there's some labor shortages here and there, for just a lot of reasons, and uh, and that that is one one reason uh, why. And there there are some products that are specifically for restaurants. Restaurants are still not back to full capacity, so mm-hmm. things like mushrooms, which are predominantly sold in restaurants, are still suffering. Yeah. Uh, but there are other other things that are are the, the prices are really strong. That's good. Uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about hemp. I guess the last time we were talking was on that Atlas Seed webinar, and there was talk about yeah. y- you doing some direct seeding trials of autoflower. So, what do you have in the ground hemp wise? Well, how's that going? Well, we did uh, do direct seeding of autoflower. I did a couple different varieties. Uh, based on my experience last year, I did do direct seeding. Uh, I did that in the beginning of July, and the conditions that we had last year, I would say it was very much of a success. So I went into 2020 here thinking, well, this direct seeding thing is definitely the future. It's the way to go. It's going to cut down expenses and so forth. And um, I can say I was somewhat confident going into this season. Uh, that being said, um, we did have a cold spring, kind of colder than normal, up mm-hmm. till about the middle of June. Soil temperatures weren't that warm uh, to begin with. And we know that hemp has pretty much genetically been not, I'll say it this way, has not been selected for uh, early season emergence and strong emergence because most of the varieties have been grown in greenhouses and potting yeah. soil and so forth. So all that to say is, our emergence was was subpar um, uh-huh. this year. Uh, now we did keep planting, and as the season went on, things got a little better. But it was kind of a reality check. Uh, you know, this whole hemp uh, experience, as we all know, is it's so new that uh, there's just a lot of things that are uncovered even over a couple years' time. Yeah, right. So I would have to say, right now, the direct seeding has taken somewhat of a setback in the context of its success, uh, especially early on. Um, I do love the concept of uh, auto flower varieties. Uh, we did grow some in my high tunnels that we're harvesting now. So that's kind of nice to get some early season crop off. And that that did grow reasonably well, uh, but then again, conditions in there are very ideal. Sure. So yeah, again, chalk this up to some more learning experience, but. But I, I, in talking to other people in the industry, there are some varieties out there that do seem to be stronger in early emergence. Um, I still believe that direct seeding is what we need to be shooting for. So I'm, I'm working with Atlas Seed, and uh, we're going to continue down this road. We're going to try to make it work. Um, it may take a little longer than we expected to get right. a get good success rate in that. So right. that's where we're at. I guess there's no guarantees in farming, is there? For sure. <laughs> so, uh, what are your plans for harvest and processing? What are you um, What are you thinking this year? So, um, this year we're well, we're starting to harvest our uh, auto flowers now, and so we'll we'll be harvesting sporadically. I have a, I have a couple different plantings uh, uh, that's that's getting ready right now, and and then uh, throughout the season. I have my photo sensitive uh, varieties out there. We did transplant about four or five acres, I believe, of photos. So they'll be coming in that normal time, the end of September. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as uh, processing and so forth, I'm I'm one of uh, others out there. I know we're listening to this that I still have my 2019 biomass, but a couple months ago, I decided to try to maybe do something about that, and I'm creating my own brand. Um, so I'm creating my own brand. I'm getting uh, hooked up with extraction and bottling and so forth. So brand of what, what do you, what are the products? Uh, CBD you're oil at? and CBD products. Oh, okay. So I'll be selling, um, you know, retail wholesale. Um, I'm going to join that fray. I guess you might say, I, I do understand it's a crowded market, uh, out there, but then again, I guess I would like to, somehow have a little bit more control in what I grow here. Okay. Uh, that uh, I believe that you almost need to be a part of some type of vertical integration here to make this work right now. Yeah. Um, so 
Uh, not that I'm going to be doing my own extraction, but to have uh, a little tighter uh, plan, I will say, with extraction and distribution and all that. And that so that's where I'm headed, so that I have uh, more control in the in the whole context of from planting the seeds to literally selling the products. Yeah, right. Um, the finished products. I'm trying to picture your face on the bottles of CBD face cream. You think that'll well, sell? <laughs> well, Eric, that has not been thought about and uh, probably will not happen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we might use some logos and so forth. Right. That. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, we're, we're in the process of designing those logos and everything. It's all that all goes with all that. And it's right. Again, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. Yeah. But I do have some experience with this kind of thing. So, I'm, I'm yeah, you've done a you know, good job in branding, you know, yeah. with cover the cover crop coaching yeah. and then with hemp innovators. Yes. How is hemp innovators going? Did you have a sort so, of a, a good yeah, so spring hemp with innovators that? Is, is the group that uh, we were using for training, um, training purposes, training other farmers. And I'll, I also see for myself as a learning experience too. I, I share, I share what I know, but I certainly don't know everything. And um, so obviously a big difference from the euphoria of last year, um, the, the desire for learning more about hemp is still out there, but it's uh, way less than before. So as, as I am moving forward, um, hemp innovators is still going to continue uh, to a degree, but a lesser degree than it, what it has been in the last year. Okay. Um, so, and part of that is, I feel like, I feel like, uh, and this is maybe just me personally, but we just need to take a little step back here and, and what really is going on. You, you didn't ask me about regulations and the regulatory process yet, Eric, but no, not yet. why is that ever frustrating? Um, it is, I have up, up to about this point, I felt like, you know, we deal with it, we work through it, but it's getting to the point now where the regulations are so unclear, so vague sometimes. And then I will just have to say very unrealistic realistic, and dare I say, they're not even fair. Hmm. Um, so the, the testing is I, the more I test, the less I trust it. Uh, mm. And I'm not pointing to anybody in particular, but the testing is not an exact science. Yeah. And it feels like we as farmers are held to test results that are deemed to be exact science, but they're not. Um, and that that is getting frustrating. I'll, right. I'll, maybe I should just leave it at that for right now. But uh, well, how do you feel about that? You know, arbitrary THC threshold at 0.3 percent. Well, I feel like it's driving 30 mile an hour in the interstate. <laughs> uh, if you want to use that analogy. Yeah. Uh, where did that ever come from? I mean, 0.3 is very low in the context of the way they're looking at our test results now, which test results can vary. I mean, I'll, I will just say I had a retest of the exact same homogenized sample that was 2.5 times difference in THC. Whoa. Uh, that is, that is, in my opinion, um, uh, it's just unacceptable to have such a low standard when the testing is not exact. Right. Um, and, and, and the other thing too, I would say is because they're looking at total THC that it makes it even more variable. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, I don't know that I have the total answer. I would certainly advocate 1% to be our, our benchmark with that right. gives us wiggle room. Uh, and, and, um, I'm, I'm, but the frustrating thing for me is 0.3 is so low that in the context of variability of testing, it makes us, us as farmers, you know, we're growing a crop out here. We spend all our time and effort into it. And then we hit a rogue test or, a, a and, 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 and we get, you know, our, our crop has to be destroyed or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's some of the things that, that I, I hope can be clarified. Uh, and, and again, I'll just say, Eric, <laughs> The, the, the stuff that is being sold in the retail uh, is very little of any regulation out there. Uh, yeah, I guess we're still waiting on the FDA. Why are, we, to, why, are we, yeah. why are we being regulated at the front end when you could actually take the THC out? It's, <laughs> that's, that's a great very point. Possible. Yeah. Um, so. there, there's a book that I read recently by a guy named Doug Fine. It's called American Hemp Farmer. Okay. And he goes sort of deep on sort of the history of where that 0.3 uh, 
percent mm-hmm. came from and mm-hmm. how the guys who developed that were actually taking samples from the lower part of the plant mm-hmm. and even the stems and you know they knew it was arbitrary uh, yeah. but he also gets into really good reasons you know, why we should move it up to you know a 1.0 threshold mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I guess his point is that the plant itself wants to produce a THC it's sort of necessary mm-hmm. for the health of the plant so right. if a farmer's crop goes a little hot, it's not because he's a bad farmer, right. but he's just, it's doing, he's actually a good farmer and the plants are doing what they, they need to do. Yeah. But speaking of books, you've written a book recently, right? Yeah, I just, uh, actually the book is written. It's being uh, printed right now. It'll be out in the middle to the end of August here soon. Okay. Uh, well, what's the name the, of the book? It's called The Future Proof Farm, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. Okay. And even though the the the, to- the topic is is not totally directed to hemp, I do have uh, several uh, hemp stories in there and, and some of my thoughts on it. And uh, but it's really about where I see the future of agriculture going, the future of farming, and how I see the market, meaning the people who buy our products, mm-hmm. are now more than ever. Um, in one sense, you could say dictating, but in another sense, you could say they're asking for, I'm just going to say it this way, sustainably grown food or products. Right. Uh, so people want to know that their hemp was grown in an environmentally friendly way. And there's more than one method out there that probably qualify. I mean, I put myself in the regenerative agriculture category. Sure. It's kind of like the, 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 the one that I would fit most into currently. Um, so, so the point I'm trying to make in the book is, that there are markets out there that are indeed you want to um, supply products that are grown in a in a planet friendly way, if you will, and I, and it's kind of a wake up call to farmers. Uh, is is my first audience. My second audience is just for consumers. Um, even if you're not a farmer, you'll be interested in this book because it it's, it will show you what farmers are trying to do to meet the desires of consumers and the way food is grown. And, I have a, a large component of this is nutrition. And uh, I feel that if things are grown, if our, if our crops are grown in the right way, in an environmentally friendly way, we're going to have actually healthier tomatoes and squash and, and maybe even CBD. I mean, I've, right. I've, I'm, I'm going to be looking into this. I've had some preliminary comments on some of the test results uh, on some of my, uh, my CBD profiles here that, that, that were looking very, very good. Um, I, I'm not going to claim anything yet because I, because it's going to have to, you know, do a little more research, but, um, yeah, it's like, know. uh, what J.I. Rodale was saying back in the forties, you know, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. So That's yeah, right. I, I, listeners of this show know that I'm convinced that farmers are going to save us all. So, and it's, it's <laughs> through these, uh, regenerative practices that, and growing hemp, you know, it's going to be the future. So, Oh yeah, that, and that's why it's part of the. Of course, it's part of my story uh, in, in the, the hemp part of it. Mm-hmm. And you know, I know I'm I'm unique. Some people, you know, would say I'm out in front, um, and and to one degree I am. But you know, that's not always uh, pioneers uh, get celebrated sometimes for their accomplishments. But a lot of times you don't hear about the frustrations. For instance, mm-hmm. I just told you about my direct seeding yeah. did not go as planned, but I'm still not giving up. Um, uh, I'm going to, you know, continue continue to see to make that work, and I still believe it's the future. But, but yeah, I had um, I had some very big challenges this year that uh, that we we need to overcome in the future. Failure is the best teacher, so I'm sure you're going to learn a whole lot this year, and you'll be in a better spot for next year. We are always learning. Yeah. Well, cool. It's great to talk to you. Uh, yep. Thanks for your time this morning. I know you're you're busy on the farm, so I'll let you get back to it. Yeah. Well, but, thank you, Eric. Always a good. And again, I just appreciate what you're doing. You're really helping the hemp community and I uh, enjoy, I've, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts, so uh, good. keep it up. All right. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. All right. That pretty much does it for today's show. Thank you for listening. 
My name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper. You can always get in touch with me through email. Just send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. Or heck, you can call me up and leave me a message at 717-721-4462. I'm always looking for story ideas, interesting people to talk to, or news from the hemp industry. And if I could ask a favor of you, share our show with one other person in your life. There's got to be some other hemp enthusiast that might really enjoy this show and learn something from it. So please do that. You can always check us out online at LancasterFarming.com. And of course, follow us on the Instagram at LF Podcast Hemp. Until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. Oh, and speaking of the newspaper, remember Tom Vineski from the beginning of the show? He's got a great story on sort of the state of hemp in Pennsylvania that's going to be in Lancaster Farming this weekend. I'll have a link to that story on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. Plus, I'll have a link to Steve Groff's book, The Future Proof Farm, and to the National Hemp Association links that we uh, discussed with Erica Stark. Okay, thanks again. Episode 94 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is Copyright 2020 by Lancaster Farming, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Herlock. The wonderful music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. Industrial Hemp.